switching uh, to a kind of a, a very different type of topic, much, much more big picture in a sense, less about, you know, less about the way individuals behave and more about the nature of entire economies. So, uh, we are going to talk about growth and growth of course is in a, as I will say maybe too much the dominant narrative of, of our times. Um, end of poverty, uh, uh, the technological frontier, uh, inequality, the rise of China, I mean, issues that we are like uh, the rise of the mega corporations, the, uh, the role of innovation, uh, you know, you can't open the newspaper without encountering all of these. This is sort of the central obsession in a sense of, of our times, even under pandemic, uh, it's, uh, we, we sort of come back to these ideas all the time. Now, the reason uh, I start by calling it end of growth is that there is actually an, an uh, active debate initiated by um, a book few, written a few years ago in 2018 book by uh, uh, Bob Gordon from Northwestern University which is arguing that growth has fundamentally was a of, of a, was a fundamentally an attribute of a particular point in history and now we are sort of, we, we should not be expecting much more of uh, dramatic growth at least in the rich countries. So, end of growth is, uh, and then people have responded to that. Uh, but I, I, let me start by the facts. The facts are that if you take the trend from 1948 to 1972 or something and then you extrapolate it labor productivity today in the US would be 60 percent higher. Another way to say that is that sometime around 1972, sometimes the people give the date as uh, you know some day in October in 1972, this was the day when the, um, uh, the OPEC, the oil producers Co corporate um, sort of, I guess their association declared that they have now come to an agreement and oil prices will be raised enormously. This is 19, end of 1972, they finally get the act together, they decide they have a, a monopoly, they are going to raise the prices and they raise the prices. So, a lot of and that was a major shock to the world economies, it, it uh, destroyed the Bretton Woods agreement and had many other consequences, it was created you know when prices go, oil prices go up, this inflation. So, there was a bunch of things that happened as a result. When it first happened people thought ok fine this is, this is bad, but you know we will go back to where we were going. It will take some time to and in fact oil prices soon came down in real terms. It was hard to keep the collusion going. So, it was not you know it was not, uh, it was not the oil prices, but something else that had gone wrong because the oil prices eventually came down in real terms to roughly where they were, but the growth never really resumed. So, you have basically, uh, uh, you, if you continue the trend from 72 to 86, you get, uh, you, get, you that's an, uh, sorry, that's, that's an, even to 96 you get an even, even, even flatter uh, trajectory, but basically uh, even though there has been a, there was a little bit of a recovery um, between you know after um, maybe around 2000 again that recovery kind of petered out. So, there was not uh, over, overall I think the, the, the fact that growth has slowed is not disagreed upon. Uh, there is, and this is not just true in the US, this is labor productivity growth in all the advanced economies, the US, the Euro 28 the, and the emerging markets and you can see that basically if you what is striking is you know there were, there were, there were divergences, 
uh, the US is sometimes ahead, sometimes behind in that, in that uh, picture uh, of, but mostly you, the US and, and Euro 28 tend to track each other pretty closely. The emerging, emerging markets are quite different, they have higher labor productivity growth. But within the rich countries, there's almost, you know, as you see, they all end exactly in the same place. The productivity growths are, are uh, very, very similar. That's the, the striking fact is how, how, how much of this US ex specific experience is reproduced in all the countries. Now, the first question that a lot of economists have reacted by is saying, look, there's something wrong with this. We see there's so much innovation happening. What about the rise of Facebook, Google, I don't know, Instagram, name, name, name your favorite uh, product and they're all exploded since the mid uh, 2000s. And like, you know, starting in 2000, we see an explosion of innovation. Uh, you know, Facebook becomes, you know, Google becomes Google, then Facebook becomes Facebook, then Instagram becomes Instagram. And no doubt there are other things that I, I don't even know about which are now transforming the world. So how could we, this be true? Now, what's interesting about this is that in some ways it's pointing to a defect in the way we measure economic activity. It's not, this is in, in, a, in, a, fundamental, in a fundamental way. Um, the the uh, way we think about GDP uh, is we, we take things that are uh, people pay for and we add them up. So we, we, the, the starting market transactions are central to that. And that was always true. It was always true that if, uh, if you, you um, women uh, who work at home were never counted in GDP. To take the most egregious example, women, women's work. Uh, if a, a, a woman uh, takes a job, um, in, you know, I know, uh, selling uh, something in a shop and hires a, a, some other woman to clean uh, her house and uh, make, you know, make dinner or something, GDP will go up even though the activities have not changed. Uh, the, you know, so it's, it's, it's the same activities being done. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really um, always been a bit like that. And you know, it's, you, it's, it, it's only approximately a measure of welfare. You know, if you, uh, you, the, the time you spend with your friends laughing is not counted in GDP, but it's clearly welfare. And uh, if we changed the world so that you couldn't do it, you would be sad. So it's it, it, uh, so we, we always knew that, but it's still true that there is maybe maybe it, the magnitudes matter. And I don't know what is. I think the implication is somehow that um, certain magnitudes are more serious than others. I don't know the underestimation of women's work strikes me as being enormous or any housework in general strikes me as being much bigger than anything else I can think of. So I, I don't even know that I buy that argument. But the claim is that look, in 2000, 80 billion photos were taken and each picture was whatever, processed and you know, all that and that cost 50 cents per photo. Okay, 40 billion dollars. Of. Now, there are 1.6 trillion photos taken. You can see most of them on Instagram. Uh, and those photos are, they cost nothing essentially. It's just, I mean, they, uh, they cost something, but minimal amounts. Because you, you know, you just, you have your phone, you take a photo, maybe there is a small amount of depreciation on your phone and there is probably a tiny bit of extra electricity you used in each each shot you take, but it's it's tiny and it's really an order of magnitude. So it's it's only affordable because uh, it's so cheap. And I think that this is this is 
not counted, the pleasure of those photos is not counted in GDP, but as I was saying, nor is the, uh, the pleasure of your mother's soup. Uh, so I, I think that that's, that's, a, that's a little bit uh, the nature of the beast. People are, therefore people want to argue that we should just somehow count what's happened is welfare has gone up enormously in the last, last uh, 20 years. We should count welfare and not, not uh, uh, not uh, measure GDP. So, just to, before we uh, uh, sort of delve into that exercise a little bit, because I think that's important in understanding what's actually happening. Uh, let me say one thing about you know the conceptualization of GDP. The GDP is the market value of all the goods and services produced in a specific time period. It's not welfare, I already said that. Uh, and now, what, 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 how is Facebook treated? In? So Facebook is an advertising company. It provides services to other manufacturers and other you know, people who sell other things. And as an advertising company, Facebook, the people who work at Facebook, their salaries are counted. So th that's part of GDP. It's an input like, you know, it's just like producing steel, which will be used by somebody else to make buildings or something. It's the same, same exact, it's an intermediate good. You produce intermediate goods, you, uh, you um, sell them. Um, the value added you generate in that process is counted in GDP. So you, you take some input, you sell it for some, some other, uh, other price. Uh, what is not, but for the consumers, Facebook is free. And they're, they're paying in terms of their own advertising attention, but attention to advertising, but I don't know how much that's, that's, uh, uh, I don't, uh, there's no, they're not paying money, so there's no way to count that in GDP. So that, that is all, all Facebook is entirely therefore counted as on the production side you know, what it takes to, to improve the software, to keep it going, et cetera, et cetera, but nothing, none of the consumption of Facebook. And I think that's, that's what people are, people are uh, complaining about. They're complaining about what about the consumption of Facebook? Because most things that we produce, we also, somebody also buys. That's the, the, that's the, I mean, that's not true, as I said, of your mother's soup, but many other things. Uh, people buy, and pe because people buy them, we know that they are uh, how to how to value them. Um, so here's an experiment uh, to value Facebook. They, the first thing they do is they uh, this uh, Alcorn and Genskow is they ask a set of they actually multiple experiments of this kind ask a set of Facebook users. This is the biggest and I think best done uh, to to name a price for how much they would take to stop using Facebook for a month. And people name different prices, then they take the kind of the, the, the middle of that, uh, it's not quite the middle, it's 61% um, of these people were, were willing to pay $102 a month or less, and so they picked $102, some number close to $100, and said, look, you know, we'll pay you $100, and uh, then among the people who had bid less than $100, uh, they, they chose 580 to, and deactivated Facebook for a month, and it turns out that almost all of them stayed deactivated. After the end of the month, they were again asked the same question, but now with the experience of not having used Facebook for a month, doing the same same kind of exercise. Um, what do we learn? Deactivating Facebook saves an hour a day. You spend an hour, and you spend that watching TV, hanging out with friends, etc. People say they're happier. Okay, that's a, a clue that you should uh, worry about when I tell you the rest. Okay, for the deactivated. Facebook use drops by 
22% after reactivation. So they don't quite go back to where they were. But they still want to be paid. They want to be paid not a little bit less, 14% less than they were asking, but they still want to be paid to give it up. Now, exactly what they, that want means is, a, is not entirely clear. Maybe they think that they are, you know, and they shouldn't they should continue to bargain because they will get more money um, but none, none, none people don't often understand the strategic uh, this other literature showing that when you have these kind of these uh, market like mechanisms people often don't understand they are over strategic so maybe they were being more strategic than they should have been but in any case um, they still want money for it and that's that's sort of key because it's uh, uh, they are, they're still saying look i i even though i feel better off i want to be paid paid for now if they, if you take that seriously then facebook is valued a lot, is extremely valuable it's it's 25 billion dollars a month uh, of value is being generated by by that e even if you count the amount that people who have now experienced the loss of Facebook and have decided. Now, why do, why do they say that they are better off uh, without Facebook but still want it? Uh, it's, it, it's, not, it's not clear uh, how one, so one could, what this says is that we could make the case that we should add two trillion dollars to GDP. If we took Google, Facebook, etc., we could add two trillion dollars of to GDP. So this 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 could be uh, a, a, a lot of money. On the other hand, people when they the fact that people say that they uh, they don't they like their life without Facebook better and still want to be paid. One reason might be that they realize that while they like their life better with Facebook, they can't get out of Facebook until their friends do. And so I don't know how much of this is just that the experiment doesn't pick that up because you know you 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 can't leave you this is because after all if all your friends are you know all the party party invitations are on Facebook then it's you know you can't live without that so in some ways I don't know how, how what to make that I also don't know uh, I also don't know uh, how to value the other stuff you know it's, it's not it's not it's not it's not clear um, if we do that but we also say that well part of that time time came out of you know cooking for your friends and what's the extra welfare generated by that I mean why why just count Facebook why not add every, everything else that that also changed in that process so I, 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 it's hard for me to quite calibrate the, this number properly um, but it's still true that in principle we could be missing as much as 0.5 percent of growth every year if we, if we take this idea seriously so that's let me stop there so I the, I don't really my sense is that people are even after this experiment we don't know how to resolve this we are I'm inclined to say that you know the measure of GDP that we have is imperfect but it's probably uh, we partially fixing it to include some things but not others doesn't strike me as being obvious. I'm going to continue to take the view that something interesting happened in 1972, something real slowed down in 1972. I'll take some questions. People are basically interested in what the alternatives should be, but I think we're going to get to this now. The alternatives to GDP, for example, in this case, if we can't use money, what should we use then to measure uh, the growth that you have explained? Oh, I, I don't think I'm going to come to that and uh, I, I think that's a, I don't think that is we have a good metric of that I think we we are basically you know there's a Bhutanese solution of uh, you know uh, sort of measuring happiness of everybody but it's, it's not clear I think we know that those measures are also 
uh, in complicated to interpret. I think the, the, there is a debate, for example, of whether there's a hedonic treadmill, whether people, after a point, they, they start get, even if you give them more money, they get used to it and then they still start feeling they don't have, they need even more. So to the extent that there's the hedonic treadmill, for example, we would worry that, you know, uh, this is picking up some, uh, some other, uh, we'll, we'll end up in a situation where we'll, we will uh, again have to think, well, why, why is it that, you know, yesterday you said your hundred dollars will make you happy, but today you say hundred dollars isn't worth it. You got the hundred dollars and you're not happier. Uh, what do I make of that? So I, th I think there's a, most measures are imperfect. My sense is that I, I'd rather stick to um, you having one consistent measure and then um, if it's try to think of, I mean, I, I think that the argument for adding women's work to, to GDP is, I think, more compelling than the uh, one for adding Facebook, especially if you include the fact that Facebook, as we saw, was making people unhappy. Uh, I, I would say right now, I, I'm, my guess is that I, I would want to stay uh, with a more conventional measure and start by adding all the other things. Incl if you were to add Facebook and Instagram, we should add a bunch of other things as well. And then, then we see what happens because it may be that these are going up, but other things are going down. And on net, we are, we may be overstating growth by, by adding them in. So I, I, I don't want to, I don't like the piecemeal addition part at all. So I'll, I'll stop there and continue. Um, so no, I want to now continue to talk about, um, what happened? So what happened in 1972? Well, I think what's interesting is Bob Solo, who was our colleague and is still our colleague at MIT, though he now doesn't teach anymore. In 1956, at the height of the kind of post-war boom, he predicted that slowdown, a slowdown is coming. And that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very much um, was, a, you know, a sort of one kind of thing that, you know, it takes a lot of courage to do because you know you look you see everything is you're in in the middle of this big boom you think it's everything is great and you, you you're a young scholar you he was not 30 yet and he he basically wrote this seminal paper say, telling us that you know growth will slow down and his argument was look in the short run uh, you have many opportunities you can take advantage of by accumulating skill accumulating capital but eventually, uh, the, the scarce resource in an economy is going to be labor. And that scarce resource, what's going to happen is that, you know, you're going to add more and more capital to the same laborer, but a person can't operate five machines at the same time. So at some point, you're going to hit diminishing returns. You're going to get people, people are going to, uh, you know, uh, productivity is going to um, go up but at a diminishing rate. It's going to be, labor productivity will be rising, you'll be adding more machines, but the machines are going to not give as much. And as a result, you may start to feel less inclined to invest as well. So the whole process might organically slow down over time because at some point you're, even though now, right now, it looks like there's lots of labor and lots of young people willing to work. Uh, eventually, those people will all be busy and you'll still be adding machines and those machines will be less productive. So that was very much, very simple logic, but it, 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 it suggested that eventually productivity should slow down. What that implies, and they, so Solos doesn't say that growth will stop. He says that eventually growth will be pushed by new ideas. The new ideas is where, uh, that's the one thing that you don't run out of, or at least that's what he was arguing. Uh, and therefore, uh, you will continue to see um, productivity, um, productivity going up uh, over time. Uh, because basically technology will get better. 
and 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 that uh, the idea that technology will get, get better is um, it has been true it's been going you know there is basically what you do is you measure the difference between gdp growth and all the growth that is you you think can be attributed to growth in you know labor uh, capital skills etc you you have some measures of those you subtract it off you take the residual so that's a bit bit you do and you say what's happening to the residual what's left after you use you after you allow for the improvement in labor allow improvement in capital improvement in skills uh, you subtract it all off what's left is productivity so measure that way that's called tfp uh, total factor productivity and and this graph shows that basically these have been uh, you know bouncing around quite quite a bit there were period of of slow slow growth then right after the war you see the the high high numbers especially in in the euro area in europe um, and then, then and and Japan, all all of these um, the and then you see that all of them are coming down. So what what Solo didn't tell us anything about is why eventually we see the reason why growth is, seems to be slowing is partly because TFP growth is actually slowing. It's the productivity is not growing as fast. Despite all the stories about you know innovation and you know disruption and you know if you open a business press you see all all this glorification of change and yet the the measured TFP growth has been coming down close to zero and you can see that that's, that's the the deep challenge of these economies comes from that from this now part of that is uh, just to sort of uh, pre, uh, pre shadow foreshadow what I'm going to talk about is, is sort of normal which is that uh, some of that was these countries were n not yet at the frontier they are still they were uh, using technologies that were technologies that were uh, available in other countries so that's why you see US and UK slowing down earlier than the euro area partly euro area was technologically behind the US and UK they could adopt the technologies that US and UK had already adopted and grow faster so technology growth was faster uh, for a period after the war in 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 the euro area because a lot of these countries were technologically behind or they had uh, and the war had created enormous displacement so the displacement also created opportunities for you know let's now go back to the efficient use of resources and that generated growth so there was a there was a period where you know uh, there were just many many opportunities caused partly by the war costly cost partly by technological backwardness uh, which then generated opportunity for fast growth but that eventually as you hit the frontier as you start using resources efficiently you run out of those things and after that we basically see everywhere everywhere a very convergent pattern so the, this sort of uh, you know I'll let you spend a minute on the on on the cartoon uh, uh, but well, what, the 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 thought you want to think about is what is it that why how can this be this idea that you know TFP growth is um, slow in in rich countries how could that be consistent with the idea that you know and, and not in poor countries we saw already that the, the TFP growth the can labor productivity continues to grow in poor countries well wh how could that be consistent and that's two parts to the story one part of that story is that the sort of con the part we I already talked about which is that the poor countries are are able to add you know their uh, their labor is still not uh, 
you know, overused. Their labor is still uh, working with relatively little capital, so we can add machines and the workers, better machines and workers will be more productive. So that's partly what's happening in those countries. Also what's happening in those countries is just what I mentioned about Europe in the in the immediate post-war period, which is that they are adopting new technologies. So while it's true that the cool stuff, you know, Instagram is coming out of the US, a lot of the, the scope for improvement is comes from the stock and not the flow. The flow of change is still slow. What's really enormous is the new, te the old, uh, the technologies that were invented five years ago in the US and are now old technologies in the US, but are, can be adopted, adapted, reused, re, uh, you know, recycled in poorer countries. And those technologies, there's an enormous volume of those which have not been used yet. So that makes it much easier for poor countries to adopt new technologies and improve their productivity than it is for rich countries. Rich countries have to They've already adopted every, everything that's obvious. And so they're really pushing, they're relying on the marginal change at the frontier. Poor countries are much more able to use opportunities that have already been, already been created by rich countries. And therefore, they are able to go faster. So I think that's a, uh, that's, that, that, that might help us understand why, in general, we would expect productivity growth to be um, slower in richer countries. Uh, is there a question? Okay, I'll continue. Uh, <clears throat> now, if you take what I said so far, this should be very good news for poor countries. Because I've been saying that you know, poor countries have more opportunities. They have you know, technologies that are not used. There are, you know, they are uh, ideas that can be adopted, they can be, they can invest, you know, investment in capital will pay off more because there's more labor that's already underused labor. So, you, you know, investment in skills will pay off more because there are more uh, ways to use those skills. So, the, all of that favors poor countries. And you would think that that means that poor countries should catch up with rich countries. And in some ways, Solo was careful to say, that's not necessarily true because poor countries might have, you know, for example, they might be culturally different, they might have less inclination to save, etc. Uh, that's, uh, you can see that that's, there is some variation in that, though some of the poorest country, uh, the biggest savers in the world are all, all relatively poor countries. So it's not the case that the Solo's view was very much that poor countries, if they don't save, they're not going to accumulate, but it don't, turns out that that's not true. But even given all that, the thing that is striking is that graphic, which is the growth rate between 1950 and 1995 is on the vertical axis, on the horizontal axis is, is a GDP per capita in 1950. And it, what that plot says is there's no pattern. Some of the poorest countries have grown fast, some of the richer countries have grown fast, uh, and there is no co correlation. So poor countries are not catching up with rich countries. I think that's, that's, a, a, that's a, a, a sort of a first warning about, you know, we need to worry about what's, what's going wrong here. Because it's, the, the solo story seems to do a good job of explaining what happens in the rich countries, but, and, but it then suggests that poor countries should actually have many opportunities which are, uh, which are uh, you know, extremely rewarding and therefore they should do much better and they should catch up. And what we see is that the growth rate, which is sort of what we should have expected is a downward sloping curve. The poorest countries would have the highest growth rates. We see no, this, is a, this is a scatter plot. But there is absolutely no pattern here. So I think one way to go from this, which is where a lot of um, you know, people who are influenced by solo like me have ended up is saying, 
in the end we just don't understand growth very well there's a lot of there are too many things going on and you know we don't really have a have a, a great way of interpreting we have very few uh, countries and hundreds of different theories and therefore we don't really manage to say very much about you know what are the ultimate uh, reasons why uh, why uh, growth uh, hasn't you know why we don't we do really don't we're not really good at understanding what the sources of growth are so that's that, that would be a position that um, solo mostly took he said look you know tfp growth just happens and some and then you know people new ideas somehow get generated and then they spread they spread you know and it in some sense when you think of gdp gdp uh, is what is produced in let's say france a german company could invent a new technology and invest it in their firms in in their factories in France and then French productivity would also go up. So it doesn't even have to be that there is any correlation with where it's invented and, and how productive it is. So it's in some sense it, solos, the Solovian view is very much that you know all of these things spread in some complicated way but it's, there's no particular other, we don't really have much of a handle on, on where these countries are going. Um, so this, this is um, where our growth theory was uh, in 1980, mid-80s. Mid when I was a graduate student, this was, this was the state of growth theory. And then suddenly there is a, a set of potential revolutions. And I want to tell you about that next. Is there any, any question? Okay. So, the, the discomfort with this narrative, the Solovian narrative is uh, very much that, you know, there's some very uh, organic factors, uh, there's some, you know, you, you, you have a process of accumulating capital and labor, maybe some countries uh, are better at those, some countries are better at accumulating capital, accumulating skills, and then beyond that technology just changes so it's not clear that there is that much you can do to change growth especially in the long run in the long run growth seems to be mostly as we saw uh, it all goes to the same place it doesn't matter you know all the uh, rich countries seem to be in the roughly the same place so that's very much the kind of a view that especially in the rich countries we can just you know give up throw up our hands and say that you know we'll, we'll, whatever happens will happen uh, and um, now that's that I'll, as I'll come back to that's not a message that was liked it was a message that was always resisted both I think uh, by the political system the political system uh, right after the you know the the crash of 1972 the political system's reaction is this can't be happening. So uh, there were there were many attempts to kind of push growth by increasing government spending, which turned into a lot of inflation. And the economy didn't start growing uh, any faster, but the inflation went up. That that invented got us invented the term stagflation. So there was like there was a there was a set of attempts to fix it, which none of which really did much. And so and then. So somehow, uh, at the end of that uh, end of that process, we uh, got um, sort of Margaret Thatcher and Reagan uh, in the U uh, Reagan in the U.S., Margaret Thatcher in the U.K. saying, "No, we have to change everything. We are just get doing everything wrong." And so there was a um, very substantial political move towards the right, towards eliminating, you know taxes and making liberalizing and with the idea that that's what we need to restore growth now that didn't restore growth either so then then uh, we were we were a bit back so this is um, this is still the mid 80s is still when people were a little bit optimistic about those programs i was we'll see that they didn't do much in any case but you know uh, there was the the impulse to try to theorize in a way that makes it 
easy to identify effective policies was clearly already there. The political impulse was there. People were trying to figure out how to, how to justify intervening to make growth come back when growth had gone away. So that, that's, that's the environment in the 1980s. 1970s, the growth slows down, so people are starting to get slightly impatient with the Solovian message that there's not much we can do. It's slowed down and it's a bit hopeless. That doesn't, that was an uncomfortable message and it was one that people were resisting. So the, but even more, I think the, the most, um, the most uh, compelling arguments came from Bob Lucas, who's a, you know, a Nobel Prize winning economist at the University of Chicago, who argued that especially the thing that's most, the biggest failure is not, remember I said there's no convergence, that the poor countries don't grow fast faster than rich countries, Solo must be wrong, and this is critical because we, we, have, we are missing, clearly missing something, we need to help the poor countries grow faster. So he made an impassioned plea for a different kind of thinking which will allow us under, to understand how to make poor countries grow faster. And he gave the example of India um, as this country which has persistently failed to grow and uh, be, this is in the mid 80s, this country that failed to grow, if it had only, if the solo model was right, India just would have been much richer than it is. And, and uh, he makes the case that there's something wrong and he wants us to, uh, so this is 30 years after Solo's original paper and people are now really getting. Uh, so, one, um, one idea that uh, Lucas actually alludes to and is developed by Paul Romer who also won the Nobel Prize uh, for his work on growth theory is the, is the idea that maybe, maybe what we are missing is the power of ideas because what's what's distinctive of ideas is that they don't have to be embodied in any one person. It could be that basically we can uh, even even though uh, even though uh, you know there is uh, you know there's only so much uh, so much uh, uh, you know machines that a person can operate. It, maybe the presence of of ideas makes everyone more productive. So in, you know, even the even the unskilled laborers just absorb the particular culture of a particular place, and therefore become more productive. And therefore, you can. Uh, so instead of having one worker, you, are, you, you the worker himself becomes better over time because he's he lives in a more educated place, and therefore he's more able to absorb new ideas. And therefore, even uh, you know the, the you know the U.S. farmer can look up his you know he lives in a place where he's aware of technological change and he's always looking for the latest technology. The Indian farmer is much more stodgy. So that, the vision was that ideas spread in a way that is different and sort of disembodied, and they spread around. And if if people are exposed to ideas, they're just more productive. And that that. That doesn't have to require even that doesn't require investment or acquiring more uh, more machines. It just makes pe people even the people who don't have any other advantages can have those skills. And the example that uh, Paul Romer uh, often has emphasized is Silicon Valley the cafes in Silicon Valley where you overhear great ideas from other very smart people who are around. And the vision was of a million sili Silicon Valleys. They are, you know, they are, uh, it's not that people, mm, you know, the ideas around, they float around, nobody pays for them, they're just in the air. This is, this is the idea of a, what is called a spillover, something that just comes to you without putting any any effort into it. You, you just and that, and therefore, it's not an investment. It's not a choice you are making. You just happen to live among all these 
very well educated people, even if you don't have much of an education, you benefit from it. And that that's precisely makes that mechanism. So then, even though I'm, I'm an unskilled laborer, I'm much more semi-skilled laborer, I'm much more productive in uh, California than I'm here uh, in, I don't know, in India. So that, that's the idea that was uh, Ro Roma's pushback uh, against the sort of the Solovian theory. Go ahead. Um, one person would like to know what do you think about policies that are affecting TFP through government policies such as uh, Skill India, Startup India, etc. And the second question uh, about your perspectives on the degrowth movement or circular economy models. So let me, uh, on the degrowth movement, I think we're going to have much more of a conversation about that when we talk about climate change. So let, let me wait on that. On the investment, uh, you know, public investment, I think we, we are going to come to that either in, in a few minutes or at the beginning of the next lecture. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about what do we know about the success of these interventions. And I think Skill India in particular, even in, in the Indian government is seen as not being very successful. And I think that's a general pattern, which is these um, government attempts to improve productivity is only limited evidence of success. But I'll give you one example that is, uh, right now I'm going to give you one example of uh, what I think is called, uh, I think very much seen as a success. So the question is, so this is one idea uh, is, uh, that's around is, you know, this is built on this idea of spillovers. You want to have other, you know, well-educated, high-skilled people around and that somehow benefits you. And, and that idea is certainly states believe it. So in the US, Wisconsin paid $3 billion to get a $10 billion plant. They really wanted to have a high skill. Foxconn is a, you know, a Chinese company that produces hardware and they wanted something high skill in Wisconsin. So they, 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 they attracted that. The Amazon shopped around its <coughs> HQ2 Again, the idea was that this will be this will have spillovers. Lots of cities bid on it, and bid money to uh, to uh, to help Amazon come there. Now, of course, that's not necessarily all about productivity. Some of it is just, you know, if I'm paying welfare to a lot of workers uh, and Amazon comes and employs them, then for me it's a gain. It's a net transfer to the state. So there, there, is a, there, there are all kinds of reasons why you do that. Some of those are just fiscal. But I think there is also evidence that <coughs> there is, the, these kind of spillovers exist, though we don't necessarily know exactly why. So the, you know, the Tennessee Valley Authority was a set of uh, projected uh, enormous uh, dam, dam, combination of, of enormous dams, uh, hydroelectricity generation, road construction, etc. The combinations. Uh, these were all proposed in the 1930s. Only out of the seven proposed, six were not built for various political reasons. So this is there's a nice paper comparing what happens in areas where we are proposed for it were not built and the one place where the Tennessee Valley Authority was built. It's interesting, there's a book by a quite famous urban theorist claiming that the Tennessee uh, Valley Authority was a failure. She didn't seem to have done the arithmetic on that well because when the authors computed, they, she's, they find that it added net $6.5 billion to the region. So it was actually a success. You can compare, as I said, the places where it would have been built with the places where it was built, and we see that it was actually a, a rather a success. Another similar, uh, similar uh, person um, play paper is from, you know, the, this Moretti is the person who's actually in both of these papers, the Ten Tennessee Valley Authority paper and this million dollar plants paper. This is a 
this is the city is bid on large plants and they say come and build it in my county uh, and there's the winner and the runners up and you can compare the winner and the runners up which are often very similar in terms of all the scores they are pretty similar um, and see what, whether you see uh, a long term effect and you find that um, TFP of plants that so for example BMW uh, could have gone to Greenville South Carolina uh, or to o Omaha Nebraska once finally it went to South Carolina uh, you can compare the two you know what what happened in the in Omaha and what happened in this in, in Greenville and what you find is that the on average plants that were already there so this is very much the idea of a spillover the idea that the plants that were already there you know factories that pre-existed if you look at their TFP after uh, this uh, this million dollar plant was built you see that they are now much more productive they're 12 percent more productive so that's an enormous kick to GDP you get a, 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 a you know you BMW was paid 150 million dollars to go there you gain 430 million dollars per year so you know one year once you pay about 100 million to BMW you BMW sets up a plant every year uh, you get 430 million dollars extra so that's a, uh, so there clearly that that's great now does that mean that the US could accelerate growth by creating new industrial clusters well that depends a bit on where the gains are coming from you could imagine one on one side uh, this is just making everybody more productive because they are uh, they, the air is you know BMW is creating brought in all these skilled laborers they're talking great ideas is making me who works in a coffee shop more more you know productive uh, but on the other, other side you could imagine um, something that's uh, very uh, very different you could imagine that um, what happens is the, that these there was excess capacity in these firms and these, these firms are now uh, there was big factories uh, which have been used now they start importing labor from elsewhere to produce that Productivity actually goes down somewhere else and goes up in these places. So it's, it's not clear exactly how much of it is on net. So I'm, I'm going to st stop here. So what we, so just to summarize, what we know is that um, these interventions do contribute to uh, the productivity of the area. What we are less clear is whether that can drive growth and because to drive growth you not only you need to contribute to the productivity of this the area where you are investing or the public interventions happening without reducing the productivity elsewhere you are drawing resources else from away from elsewhere and it's not clear how which which of those two is happening Moretti who is author of both the papers maybe he's too much of a pessimist he argues that on net at least in the US there is no net effect. Hello again, uh, we're continuing the conversation about growth uh, which we were at the end of the last lecture. Just to remind you uh, where we were was thinking about is there something we can do to boost growth rates and it starts from a fact which I emphasize which is that what striking about growth rates in the OECD um, among the rich countries of the world is a, a kind of a convergence to a slow uh, kind of slow slow productivity growth and slow growth in total factor productivity kind of the part of growth that's not explained by adding capital or labor so that that and that's the convergence is actually striking how how much all the countries uh, in the OECD seem to be growing roughly at the same slow rate and that's despite the fact that you know there's been all this talk of technological revolution after technological revolution 
uh, if that's happening, it could be happening, it's, it's too soon to rule out the possibility that that will eventually show up as a massive boost to growth in the world. But right now what we see is slow growth, um, not, I, I, I think one can fight over, over the numbers and just about how slow, but I think the general perception that growth is rather you know, slow uh, and not particularly uh, dramatically transformed by this technological revolution that's apparently sweeping through the world seems robust. So, I, 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 so that's the starting point of, of where we were and then I think be, there was, I was uh, suggesting that there was a, a natural pushback against that. The, 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 in the mid 80s you start to see people saying, look you know, let's, we just have to rethink this and, that, there was, and the impetus there was not just to drive growth in the OECD where maybe one doesn't care so much about much more growth, but also to drive growth in poor countries uh, because I think there was one of the predictions of this theory which says basically growth in rich countries inevitably slows down uh, is that the flip side of that should be that growth in poor countries it should be fast. And that we didn't find. We did find the slowdown in the rich countries without finding the, uh, you know, the uniformly high rates of growth in poor countries. Now there were some poor countries that have grown spectacularly. Overall the world has seen a catch up by poor countries. The share of GDP that's uh, in poor countries has gone up. Uh, I'll come back to that point of exactly what's the shape of that, but I, I think that it's, it's still true that if you look at the correlation between growth rates in poor countries and how poor they are, there seems to be no correlation. Poorer countries don't grow faster. So that, that, that set of uh, thoughts has driven um, conversations about, you know, what exactly could be going on and relatedly if there is something we can do to fix all, all this and maybe even change growth rates in rich countries. And in that context there has been co these conversations about spillovers about the idea that maybe what we are missing in the story, in solo story of growth is the fact that a lot of, a lot of what drives growth are not individual actions but the sort of the collectivity of wisdom that's around for example and the idea for example that cities might play an important role and in that context Paul Romer who was one of the idea, uh, sponsors of this idea that spillovers are important comes up with this idea that maybe um, what, what developing countries in particular need are what he called charter cities. So that's the shape of um, cities in many parts of the world. This one's from India but you could find that shape and what you should notice in that picture is just the low quality of the infrastructure and clearly you know not a lot of regulation. The building is kind of uh, cobbled together with, with you know metal sheets and uh, whatever uh, duct tape and uh, plastic and you know that kind of city, cities where you know it's unsafe to live where the quality of the infrastructure is poor which are which then generate uh, sort of very concentrated living by the rich who stay away from everybody else and therefore maybe the spillovers are much more limited. That kind of a world seems um, quite uh, so 130 million people in South Asia live in informal settlements without legal sanctions and proper, proper infrastructure, places where they don't have much interaction with for example uh, more educated people. Uh, so one of the thoughts he had, Paul Romer had was maybe we should just try to build better cities and maybe countries with their you know in, internal challenges are not in a good place to do that. Maybe we can take on uh, maybe an NGO which he set up to, to set uh, which would build charter cities, cities that countries would basically contract with this NGO to run these cities and these cities would be then 
you know, with good infrastructure, good environment, good politics, there would be sort of oases inside uh, these maybe less uh, well-run economies where uh, enterprise would flourish and people would, people would um, benefit from these spillovers. So that, that, that's very much this vision of city. If cities are where spillovers happen, let's build cities. And so he set up this NGO. And I think the, his idea was that, you know, we will probably need some outside guarantor. This should be a contract where the, uh, some outside guarantor, like the government of Switzerland, this is, takes on the responsibility of running, uh, running the uh, kind of the enforcing the rules in the city in country X. Uh, so in, in Ghana, there's a city, or in, in, in Honduras, uh, you see why I mentioned that, there'll be a city and the government of Switzerland with its you know, relatively good reputation for, you know, probity and rule of law will be running that government. So that, that vision was very much um, uh, something he, he put his, remarkably, he actually went and did it. Most academics don't do these things. He set up the NGO, he went and put his energy behind it. His one client was Honduras, which wanted to uh, have 20 what they call ZA clusters, where there's a zones of economic development. I don't know, it's in Spanish, but those words are there, economic development zone. And for a while it was going well. Uh, they, they were, the government sort of at least used the right words. Uh, but then Paul, I think, for, for found himself becoming increasingly uh, uncomfortable. And he's given interviews about this, so it's not, a, I'm not revealing some secret. He, I think he says, I, I kept feeling more and more uncomfortable because even though the government was paying lip service to the message I was delivering, in fact, the power structures they were creating were much more like kind of what were famously the banana republics the, uh, of uh, Latin America, where uh, the United Fruit Company, an uh, American company, basically controlled the government. So they, they were more collusive efforts between the government, uh, the, uh, the, uh, some private interests, uh, and some of the, the friends in government to control these places and put them outside the uh, the control of Honduran uh, law, but not necessarily under the control of any other law other than their own. So the, they were they were just basically less regulated domains inside the Honduran economy. That seemed to be the vision, and eventually um, Romer walked out. He just couldn't deal with it. And but I think this carries an important lesson, which is I think on. I think this particular experiment it remains of interest in the sense that I think the idea that better cities could drive growth, maybe, I mean, Moretti, as I said, who's one of the authors showing that spillovers exist, nevertheless argues that spillovers are not going to drive growth in rich countries because basically spillovers a lot of spillovers live off cannibalizing uh, growth elsewhere. So, you know, people, resources move from this place where there are spillovers to other places. Growth goes up in the place there are spillovers, but it goes down elsewhere. And therefore, on net, these effects are small. That's Moretti's case for it. Now, that may not be true in poor countries where really the places where you can build, um, you know, high quality industry are really much more limited. There are just very few locations where you can actually have the combination of high skilled people, low skilled people, good, good roads, good airports, uh, you know, not too polluted environment. So if you take all of the things, there are just very few places. And in fact, you find that the relative price of real estate in the, the the best, the best cities in developing countries relative to average real estate are actually extremely high. So reflecting exactly the scarcity of high, high quality, high quality 
infrastructure. So that's, that, so he may well be right. On the other hand, the idea that you could somehow put these places outside the political economy and get a commitment from the country to hold on to that may be implausible. That is, we may not be able to actually carry out something like the chartered cities just because you know the, the same reasons why the cities are dysfunctional or not as functional as they should be might come back to bite the charter cities that you know the poor politics that prevents the city the existing cities from being more functional may also be the reason why the charter cities don't actually manage to deliver or they don't manage to keep their independence and that that particular idea that you know some foreign country will come and protect it it just seems in today's world that seems politically implausible and so I, I think that how to get to higher quality cities in developing countries and assess their impact remains an open question. Stop there. Yes, there's one question on charter cities. The person is asking whether this is not imperialism in another form, similar to the East India Company governing the build and building infrastructure in Bengal. Oh, I, I mean, I think, I, I don't think there's a disagreement there. I think it, the question, and in some sense, Paul Collier, who's another scholar who's sort of argued for even even more explicit form of imperialism. Uh, I, I don't think, I think the question is whether or not, uh, what we, what, where I think the disagreement is, uh, I think, First, I think there, there is, bizarrely enough, I mean, from my point of view, disagreement that about whether imperialism was good or bad for these countries. I think there is, it's very hard to find good evidence on this question, therefore we don't. Uh, but the only evidence I've seen uh, that seems credible is a sort of a natural experimental experiment study by Lakshmi Iyer using uh, boundaries in India, which, uh, you know, places in India which were either left to the local uh, local uh, king to govern or taken over the, by the British. And there are only a small number of places where, where she argues there was a perfect experiment that happened. But in those places, she finds that the places that were taken over by the British actually do worse. Uh, they are now, today, worse than, they were, uh, than the places that were not. So I, I mean, I th but I, I think in general, this is not a, a question of this great evidence. My, my, I, I tend to believe Lakshmi's results, but then she was my student, I'm a bit prejudiced. Uh, but uh, but I, I think that there is a sense in which uh, that, that, that's the overarching question which remains. And so I don't think there is a absolutely you know, accepted answer to that question. And then there's a second question, uh, which is um, if, if there is a, uh, can we think of intermediate forms? So is it necessary that it's, you know, backed by uh, the Swiss government or the US government? That can it be that essentially uh, there can be internal contracts? Because I, I, the point I'm making was exactly that it needs to be an internal compulsion which drives it. In some ways, think about uh, some of the, uh, some of the, uh, history examples like Singapore, where for whatever reason, a certain set of inter internal compulsions, good and bad, uh, were uh, supported for a long time, and which there was an internal commitment to certain types of rules, which was mostly committed to and held on to for, you know, not necessarily all of them good, but th the commitment was there. And so is that entirely, do we need outsiders? Maybe not. Um, so, but there's a, I think once you start thinking about these spillovers, this idea that maybe what needs, what's important is not so much, uh, not so much uh, the, um, not so much this, uh, the fact that uh, what individuals do, but what happens kind of externally as a result of that, when individuals uh, get ideas, ideas spill over to others. 
And if and I think that the, there is a, been an interesting um, conversation, which is about saying that look, you know, m maybe what we are missing here is the role of innovations. And in some ways, you might think that why aren't we talking about innovations? Isn't aren't innovations something that why, why do why do we why is the natural way of thinking about uh, technological change kind of solo's way, which is a TFP factor which seems to be the same in all countries or you know in his theory they don't vary across countries. So why, why would that be even the right way to think about it? So this is sort of stepping back be, before we come to the question of spillovers but just asking why isn't there a more clear focus on innovation? Isn't that how technology changes? And here's the I think the helpful example that just sets our minds on that. So yes, in innovations are made by companies. They invest and they get returns. No question. What what we what that so it's not a so maybe you, so why not if we just invest more why wouldn't we get more growth? And the answer is then there's the question of you know how long can you keep uh, keep the advantage of an innovation? And I think there, that's where uh, the, the, uh, a simple example helps. So think about, um, you know, there's a country uh, um, called F, which uh, does all the innovation. And then the other countries, the, the, you know, after some number of years, let's say 10 years, all other countries get to have that innovation, either because it's licensed to them, and therefore they use that innovation. Uh, remember, we are measuring GDP, which is output produced in the country. It doesn't have to be owned by the country's people. It may be that a part of the, uh, the production is owned by country F, but still in country G, they would be producing the same, using the same technology, and there's no reason why that wouldn't happen. So maybe with a small lag, technology will move to all the countries. So all the countries will grow at the same rate, just with a lag. You know, uh, there will be one uh, initial innovation, one country will be a little bit ahead, GDP will be a little higher in that country, but all the countries will grow at the same rate. Because after five years, the second, uh, all the other countries will adopt that, their, their productivity will go up at that point, little later. But on average, over a long period of time, we'd see no difference between them. So that's, that's the idea that makes it much harder to think about, uh, think about uh, uh, sort of why, why we would think of a national TFP growth rate. That's, that's, what, that's behind. Now, that's not to say, uh, that's not to say that one could uh, not tell stories about it. Uh, it could be that, for example, some of that technology uh, so it could be could be that you know the the generation of ideas is still fast enough that uh, new ideas is still fast enough that that still keeps a country growing faster. That is, so it's, it's true that other countries are catching up, but if you keep generating new ideas, then the catch up do, just doesn't happen. So if you so it's it's not totally clear uh, you know how fast that needs to be and you know can countries stay ahead but you know I, I don't think there is an obvious uh, entirely obvious argument which says that that couldn't happen. So <clears throat> the Romer actually in wrote a second paper he wrote two very famous papers one in 86 one in 1990 and in the second paper he focuses on that issue. What can we think of countries growing faster or slower because they are generating faster ideas, uh, generating new ideas faster? And he doesn't really, so he, he's in his world, um, new ideas are the, uh, the advantage that a country has when it generates a lot of new ideas is that those ideas themselves spill over to other firms. And those firms that are in that country can build on those ideas. 
So they generate even new ideas get generated faster and faster basically. Uh, and that's, that particular piece is what gen generates, uh, generates uh, kind of growth that's, you know, one country can have faster growth than another country because of the, the fact that the spillovers don't go to other countries. So when you generate new ideas, this new idea has eventually will be adopted everywhere, but the spillovers from the process of generating new ideas is something that remains within that country and that allows that country to generate more new ideas. Now, that's a vision that uh, is, uh, I think, at some level very uplifting, it's, uh, you know, new ideas, pro promoting more new ideas. It's also not necessarily obvious that that's how we should think about it. If you think about the many fights over patents and exactly did I tweak the patent, there's right now a big fight going on between two companies whose name escaped me, one starts with an A, one starts with a B, and they're fighting over, uh, over whether, whether or not, uh, let's see, um, there's some kind of a migraine anti-migraine, they both bought anti-migraine drugs to the market and the question is which is the better one and who should have the real market and, and you know, and so it's not, it's not always uh, the case that uh, these interactions are just I generate an idea and then that has positive benefits on everybody. Uh, ideas are often designed to have negative benefits on others, meaning I just want to tweak this idea a little bit so that I get the patent and somebody else doesn't. And the social product of that activity might actually be negative because maybe the other guy's one was just as good, but this small tweak really doesn't add very much, but I put a huge amount of effort into it because I wanted to be the one who wins the patent. So, the, and. I, Agio and Howitt, uh, roughly at the same time as Romer, very much, uh, in fact, maybe even before, uh, have, right, have a very nice paper which makes the point that uh, this is actually quite consistent with how business operates, that there is creative destruction, that, the, that to, to part of the process of creation is destruction and sometimes there's too much destruction. The, you, you come up with ideas which are potentially not so much better, but they just happen to be, uh, we knew the patent and then you become the monopolist and you generate lots of money, but all the people who lose out on the process went that much worse and they didn't deserve to lose, lose so much. So I think that that idea that this is, that innovation is more of a conflictual process is, uh, is important and it, it, it comes, brings us to the key question which is where, why, why do we, you know, w how does this connect to the question of policy? So if we, if we sort of, these, these different views, one view, the Solos view, innovation is exogenous, it just happens. Then there is the Romer view, which is extra, you know, innovation is always great. It always has positive benefits for not only for the firm that's innovating, but for everybody else. And then there's the Agio Howitt view, which is that there are innovations which are good for the people who are innovating, but not necessarily good for anyone else. These are all kind of potentially these are all different uh, sort of the different uh, takes on the same process and but they have very different policy implications. In Solo's view, there's not much you can do about it. In Roma's, Roma's view, the innovator is a benefactor. He, he's, he's doing us a favor. And if he's doing us a favor, um, the, in particular, if you think that the big a point of innovation is the positive spillover. That's the point I was making. The, in terms of growth, what really matters is the spillover to other innovators. And if you think that's the key aspect of, of uh, innovation, that then it's immediate that the innovator is under rewarded. Because the, the whole thing is, I'm going to benefit a little, 
but everybody else is going to stand on my shoulders and they're going to be so much better. So that, that idea, the, the idea of standing on the shoulder of giants is absolutely an idea that then suggests that innovators should be subsidized by society. They should not be taxed, they should be you know, capital gains taxation which is often how innovators make money because they, 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 they basically think of a, a venture uh, a fund, a company funded by venture capital, you know, you, you, you make money by owning the equity of your new company and that then gives you uh, a huge boost because you know you, your innovation, um, you, your you know w when your innovation is successful, you get your stock price goes up. You own a lot of stock. Those are capital gains. So capital gains taxation is often seen as a way to reward innovators. And so this whole view that you know innovation should be rewarded and um, therefore taxes should be structured especially to uh, uh, to reward the innovators. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, by the way, low taxes. It could be that that could be consistent with wealth taxation, for example. You could, uh, you could imagine a world where estate taxation is high and, uh, and um, capital gains are not taxed. But in any case, th this, was, this is one end of it. The other end of it is um, you can imagine um, if you really believe in this idea that there might be too much innovation, you might actually not reward um, innovators as much. For example, sh you know, shortening patents might be a good thing. And we are right now we are in this world where we are talking about whether the patent of Moderna and Pfizer should be protected or not. And so maybe there is the private incentives are not necessarily aligned with the uh, with the social incentives and you know sort of forcing people to release their patents is one way to tax innovators. So I, I think there is a there is an interesting and important conversation happening there. Um, this uh, view that you know you should the rich are innovators and therefore we should job creators is a word that Americans love uh, and and uh, and therefore they should be taxed less is very powerful you you uh, you know I think Esther will spend much more time talking about that in uh, when she comes to the question of inequality I, I just want to mm, observe that you know uh, this has been one of the strongest um, sort of uh, impacts of the slowdown of growth in the 1970s was kind of the Reagan revolution. The Reagan revolution was President Reagan in the US basically arguing that we just need to give incentives to everyone including the rich and the incentives to the rich involved a tax cut which is extremely steep. So um, it's, it was 90% the U.S. taxes on the richest were 90 percent under Eisenhower, who was a Republican, and under Reagan, they were brought down to 28 percent. So this, and since then, basically no one has managed to to reverse that. Uh, you know, taxes. And Biden is now talking about it, but we'll see what happens. We, we, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not yet convinced that there's so the the kind of the ideological. Uh, weight behind the idea that for growth we need low taxes is so powerful that uh, that I don't know whether it's going to go anywhere. Do we know anything about uh, ab ab about you know whether um, tax rates induce faster growth? So that that's a that's a question that. You know, in this context, uh, it is obvious uh, question to ask, um, and I think the basic facts are uh, relatively. Uh, I think we're relatively well established. Whether you know, you could. You, the question is, uh, what the counterfactual could be. So the fact that growth has not accelerated after tax cuts is very well established. Nothing happened. In fact, uh, you know, overall, uh, you know, after Reagan cut taxes, there was a one year when tax payment went up because pe people uh, 
brought some money out of you know tax havens they were hiding their money and they brought it out so tax payment went up but even that went away very quickly so there was no um, the uh, the one way to look at it is to use the fact that the US states vary a lot in terms of uh, the, the population distribution of wealth, the wealthy. Connecticut has lots of wealthy people, Maine has almost none. So when there are tax cuts, the effect on people in Connecticut and in Maine are very different. A lot of people in Maine don't benefit from the tax cuts on the rich, but a lot of people in Connecticut, Connecticut do. So could you, one thing you could try to do is compare Connecticut with Maine. There's problems with that. You could say people in Connecticut invest in Maine, but that's less true than you would imagine. And then, then you, could, you, you can see whether when there's a tax cut where the rich in Connecticut are much more likely to benefit than the, the, the absent rich in the main, do you see bigger effects in Connecticut than in Maine, and you see nothing. And this was, a, this was a study by the University of Chicago, not a place which is famous for its communist views. Um, and, and I think in general, there, there doesn't seem to be much, much support for this view. It's a question on where I think you'll hear much more. Uh, it does have an effect on inequality. That's why in the, it's best, best to talk about this when Esther talks about inequality. But I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. And take questions. Yeah. There, there are two questions, questions on innovation. innovation. The, the first, first one is a specific, specific one on India. The, the person is wondering about your opinion about startups in India and whether they will continue to bring growth to the economy or whether it is just a bubble. And the second question is about the theory of the entrepreneurial state that is public investment being the main driver of technological innovation. And the person is wondering whether there is any merit to the theory versus the assumption that innovation mainly comes from the from the market so on the first question i don't really know i, I think that this this is an interesting question the the the, the startups in india r right now i think the view is that they have raised they seem to have ideas that the market likes but it's not clear that they they haven't generated a lot of gdp yet they're going to they these are all, all mostly on in potential they are rewarded for their potential, not for their delivery. We'll see. Uh, I, I, I don't want to have a view on this. What, what on the question of um, the entrepreneurial state? Well, in a sense, it's interesting. The state is always a very important part of innovation. If you take the, the so-called Moderna uh, and even the Pfizer uh, vaccines, that are important, you know, important part of the response to to COVID. These vaccines build on work that the National Institute of Health, which is a government uh, think tank, basically, uh, had uh, well, it's a funding organization and a think tank, but the think tank part of it internally had done. And a lot of what these companies did was they already had ways of uh, of of uh, so of making uh, changing um, altering um, cre creating um, altering genes to make have responses by the body what they what they delivered was the delivery mechanism how do you get it to the body to actually respond to, to how do you get it to the right place in the body and therefore it was a combination of public and private investment so there, there are good examples of public and private investment and certainly science in europe and uh, you know basic science has always been fi funded by by uh, the government uh, a lot of you know, the internet was funded by the military so you think of the fundamental innovations a lot of those are happening through the through the government and that's been true everywhere in the world in china in in the us in in europe it's is everywhere true that that the government does a certain kind of investment very effectively and then the question is you know are, are we at the right balance point i don't know
But I mean, I, I, I suddenly think that the experience of these countries very much reinforce the view that certain kinds of investments the government does quite successfully. Uh, um, then, do, does it do too much? Do the private sector do, do, do does it, should it do less? Uh, is there too much, um, you know, rent seeking in, uh, innovation? Uh, these are good questions. I don't know that. I'll come to a little bit to that point in a bit. And then there's one question on taxes that you just discussed. So the person is asking, when the rich businessman is taxed more, won't it distribute the burden to the poor down the line? Mm, no. If, uh, I mean, well, I, I don't understand the question. If he's taxed more, uh, you, you have to believe that he will stop, uh, you know, building businesses. If you, th if you believe that, yes. Uh, I, I, that's why I want to think we'll keep this. I'll tell you the sort of the big picture that we don't see any effects. Whether this, the, this, this is why we don't see an effect. We, we don't see an effect because basically rich people don't stop working or starting businesses when you uh, put taxes on them, and that's a, that's a fact that Esther will spend more time on. I'll come back to that. <coughs> so. I mean, this conversation uh, uh, continues, and partly it continues interestingly because more, you know, the, for example, the Trump tax cuts, which was a very large uh, cut on the taxes on the rich, justified by the assumption that this will boost, boost growth by 0.7%. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, the panel uh, of, of uh, we, we, we talked about this expert panel of economists before, and in the expert panel of economists, we know that basically no one thought that this would boost growth by 0.7%. Uh, whereas, I think the, the, if you look at the voting public, it's much more likely to think that so than the experts. So, so it, this is one of the interesting places where the kind of all the evidence is on one side, but there's a fundamental belief in America on the kind of the miraculous effects of taxes, which is sort of despite the evidence. And I think that's, that's been one of the challenges in, in, uh, in getting, uh, you know, raising taxes is people really feel scared when you raise taxes. They think that something awful is going to happen to the economy. Nothing bad happens, but a lot of poor people are against raising taxes. This is a point we'll come back to. And <clears throat> as a result, um, I, uh, this Esther will spend more time on, so I'm going to skip through this, which is that um, the share of the wealth with the top 0.1% or even the 0.01% has been rising very dramatically, as Thuma Piketty and his and his collaborators have shown it's really extraordinarily uh, high now, higher than it ever was basically. The share of the 0.1 percent is now higher than it ever was. And that's, that's a fact that uh, I think is related to this, you know, and this is before the pandemic. The pandemic has done everything to help the richest, so this is going to be even higher. So it's, it's completely clear uh, what's happening. Um, now, I don't want to spend time on this because this is where Esther will spend a lot of time. What I want to say is that what this goes with is that in every sector, the share of, of output produced by the top 50 companies has gone up by a lot. And in some of the these sectors like retail, the top four companies have, are really becoming much, much more dominant. So it's, it's really concentration of wealth and economic power in certain sectors is just dramatically increasing over time. And that's, that's a, so, um, there, there is a, uh, so this is, uh, this is, uh, goes back to this question of, you know, what drives innovation? Is it just, you know, new, uh, the attraction of new ideas or the um, desire to displace other people, uh, other people's patents? And I, I, I think the 
And that's important in this conversation because if it's the latter, you might worry that the concentration of economic power will have major effects on innovation. As if all the, all the economic power is with one or two firms, then nobody will dare to challenge them. And if nobody dares to challenge them, then you don't have to do anything either to stay in power. Because you know the reason uh, in Agio how it's world, the reason why everybody needs to innovate is partly because if I don't innovate, somebody else will, and they will take away my patent. So I g try to get the patent before they do, the new patent before they do. If other firms start becoming, you know, just not powerful enough there you know they, we, I have so much such deep pockets I could always buy them out I mean this is one of the things happening all the time Amazon buys out its competitors basically and so if, if I can buy them out then I don't really worry about the pressure of innovation because I know that basically a lot of this I can solve by buying them out and and uh, for example uh, there is the example of I I think it's uh, diapers where Amazon basically in order to force a company that they was competing with them to, to sell to them basically started dumping, selling so low that that company knew that it would have to fold. So with your very deep pockets you don't have to be good at your product to win. You just, uh, so you don't have to innovate. You can just say I'll lose money till you go out of business and then and that threat worked, they, they acquired that company, I think it was you know, diapers.com or something. So I think that there are good examples of, of exactly this worry that if we have very, very wealthy companies, they could just, they don't need to innovate, they can just threaten other companies to drive them out of business and that's going to be good enough and therefore we, we, we won't have uh, we won't have the uh, the uh, the pressure to innovate anymore. So that's the concern. Now here's a nice study. It shows basically, uh, you know, mergers in among sort of big companies need to be approved, and because they need to be approved, uh, you can look at what happens if a particular proposed merger was narrowly uh, disapproved by the you know the approve the court that's supposed to decide on it. So if you if it were a narrow uh, disapproval, you could say um, and you could compare sectors where it went through and sectors where it didn't happen. Sectors where the top companies were going to merge and sectors where they didn't merge. And when you do that, you find that where they didn't merge. There was more innovation, more investment, and more new firms. Basically, where they merged, they became so powerful that they didn't need to do anything to keep, uh, keep yeah, new companies didn't dare enter because they were so powerful that they knew that they will, could be pushed out. So that's, that particular vision seems to be, so it may well be that as we get more and more concentration of wealth, this was the concern after all in the US that led to the original uh, set of laws, anti-monopoly laws, the Sherman Act come from uh, 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 experience that there is increasing concentration of economic power. So again, we're seeing that happening and that could reduce innovation. So one reason why innovation might be falling is precisely that there is just we what we what we don't think about we think about there's a lot of you know innovative firms but we also at the same time we're getting a lot of dominant firms and that might be overall reducing the pressure to make useful innovation. Uh, is there a question? Okay, I, I continue. So, uh, all of this is sort of background to bring us to um, bring us to maybe the biggest question, uh, which is: We are so far we are talking about you know 
concentration of wealth in the US. The US is a, is a rich country. Um, it's inequality, uh, as we will argue, is a huge problem in the US. Is growth such a big problem? Maybe not. Maybe we don't necessarily want mm, you know, enormously more growth in a rich country, which is also environmentally abusive. So I, it's not clear, to, and this is an issue we'll come back to is, you know, do we want more growth? So, but where, where it's very clear is that poor countries, we want more growth. There is no, uh, there is no, I mean, there's no, at least I can't think of a, a, a good argument for leaving people in dire poverty. So if we, if we want to, to do something about that, uh, and given that we know that rich countries are unlikely to give away 30% of the GDP, you know, in the, in the world basically 0.7% of the GDP is seen as the gold standard of giving and most countries don't get there. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, so if that's not going to happen, then poor countries, the only other way they can improve the standard of living of the poorest people in the world is by growing. And I think the, 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 the sort of the, most important uh, question, if you could say something about it, uh, is uh, how does one get growth in poor countries? I, 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 I think the question of, you know, you know I, I think the compulsion to try to fight growth slowdowns is in rich countries. So I think the conversation we just had is useful to understand why, you know, it's not, oh, why uh, there aren't easy answers to the question of how to boost growth because I think the, the compulsion to keep uh, trying to raise the growth rate has been a very important influence on the, on the, on the history of the uh, rich countries, especially the, after the 1972 slowdown, the political move to the right came from the promise that we will restore growth. and that promise turned out to be false, but it was very much a very critical uh, sh shaper of the politics and the economics of the next 40 years. So it, it's been a very, very, very important influence. Uh, and and I, so I don't want to discount what we discussed. Uh, I think it was important that, that we understand why, you know, growth may not accelerate anytime soon in the rich countries, despite our sense that, you know, there's lots of talk about innovation. But I think that uh, the, if I think about the welfare question, clearly the question of growth in poor countries is the bigger question. So I, I, I want to now come to that. Uh, any, any, any interventions? Okay, so let me continue. Um, So this is something that we, we, I already mentioned, which is that, in fact, uh, growth, the, one of the sort of, in some ways, it's interesting and maybe ironic that 1986 is the year when Lucas publishes this article saying, you know, the real challenge saying what I just said, which is that the most interesting question in the world is how to get poor countries to grow. Uh, and he uh, says that, uh, and he gives the example of India and the US and says, you know, in, there's something clearly wrong in India. Uh, because if India was in the solo model version of India, where India is just like the US but just has lax resources, India should be growing much faster than the US, and it's not. So that's that's a, uh, that's the claim that uh, he makes, and he's and I think it was true before 1986. I think India was growing basically much to much less fast than would be predicted by the scarcity of resources. Basically, the idea is remember in the solo model, uh, growth slows down because you have too much machines relative to people. Conversely, if you have very few machines relative to people, then growth should be fast because you have every incentive to accumulate machines and every machine you accumulate contributes a lot to output because uh, you don't have machines and there are lots of people to work those machines. So you, it's, it's great to, uh, to invest in 
in more machines and you have every incentive to do so. So as long as you keep investing, you grow fast. So that, that uh, story, Lucas was using exactly that point that therefore India should be growing fast because India is so resource poor and it's not, there was something's wrong. Let's find what's wrong. So that was his, his proposal. The irony is that 86 is almost exactly the year where India starts growing faster. It's, it's almost, uh, and somewhere around the same time China grows going faster, maybe 84 or something. You start to see, uh, you know, the, the global GDP is transformed and uh, maybe 10 years later you start to see a few other countries, Bangladesh growing f uh, faster and then uh, Vietnam starting to grow faster. So you start to start to see a bunch of countries uh, grow, growing faster and that's, uh, but I think, I think the, the 86 uh, is, is kind of an interesting uh, date because it's literally uh, when India and China, if you had to pick a date for India and China starting to grow unexpectedly fast, it's almost exactly 86. But it's a, um, I'm sure this was not, uh, other than maybe God wants to play jokes on us, I don't see a reason why this would have happened. But it, it, whatever it is, it, it happened and, um, and this, this, this graphic tells us a very important story which is that uh, the G percent share of world GDP at PPP, should not be at PPP, at PPP, at purchasing power parity, adjusting for the fact that, you know, the same, a dollar buys more in a poor country than a rich country, um, is, is just, uh, you know, the shares have been reversed basically. Now, we, in, if you take the number 1972 as the date of 75 or whatever, 75 is when that starts and now the shares have been reversed. So that's an enormous transformation in the world. Now that's the, that's the uh, very good news. It's not necessarily uniformly distributed this even through this period. Um, you know, basically after 1980, Latin America doesn't really, 20 years of very slow growth or no growth in Latin America, 20 years of almost no growth in Africa. This is a period of Asian growth essentially. All of this is Asian growth and a few countries in Africa, but really. And then after 2000, you start to see African countries growing faster and, and Latin American countries growing faster for a while. So you, you see, so this is a combination of the two, but I think uh, it's, a, so and even there, it's not all the countries in the world. Huge number of countries have not grown at all in, in the last 40 years basically. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, a statement that we, all problems are fixed. We are just on the way to, to uh, you know, full convergence. Uh, this is, this is, is, is really, uh, a story about a small number of countries growing incredibly fast and they happen to be large countries like China, like India, like Bangladesh. These are countries which are, you know, billions of people uh, together. You know, it's between these, the, these countries, they have 40% uh, of the world's population. So this is, you know, between them, a few, small number of countries which are very, 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 very uh, big uh, will have big effects on these numbers. So that's, uh, that's the downside of these numbers, but still worth, worth, worth saying that uh, growth in developing countries has become uh, a very important part of, of, of the story. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Okay, so there's uh, one question in the chat. Uh, the person is asking, is it reasonable to expect growth uh, in both the rich and poor world, given the ecological constraints we are uh, like already approaching these days, like climate change or a loss of biodiversity, et cetera? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I, I think especially in terms of consumption, um, a lot of the um, 
the environmentally damaging consumption is being done in rich countries. Uh, I say that because, you know, a lot of the goods produced at the cost of the environment in poor countries are consumed in rich countries. So it's there is a sense in which that's a, and so I think we will discuss. We'll come to that issue exactly when we discuss climate change, which is the next chap chapter after this one. Esther will be talking about that uh, in the next set of lectures. So I, I, I don't want to you know, steal her thunder, but yeah, it's 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 a very much coming. So it's, it is a, it is a, it is a, a issue and one where you know one could easily take the view that maybe growth in rich countries is not. Uh, necessarily a huge priority. Okay. Um, so, this, this, uh, you know, in some ways is not unexpected. I already told you that the impetus of Lucas's uh, work, which on one side drove uh, Roma's theoretical work on reimagining growth theory and trying to put uh, spillovers and innovation into growth theory, also drove emp an empirical agenda. Starting with, I think, I think there, this, there was always an empirical agenda, but Barrow's uh, paper around the same time in the late, late, late com 80s comes out. Uh, with the idea that what we should do is, you know, empirically look at what what drives growth, and once we know the we, the data will tell us what drives growth, then we'll do it. So the idea was you take growth rates across countries and you regress it on, you know, policies in these countries or in so are they investing in education? Do they have low tax rates? Do they have, uh, you know? good pro protection of private property uh, you know you can pick your you can pick your uh, variables and run a regression and the and you see what what comes up significant in those regressions that was the methodological uh, status of this um, this um, this uh, enterprise and this was for a while this was um, to abuse a pun, uh, a growth industry. It was like a tremendous number of papers got written um, on this subject, and it's still, still a huge number of papers do get written on it. I'm, I'm impressed by how many get written even now, which are running cross-country regressions. Now, there are a number of reasons why these regressions, um, I mean, I think there were three problems with this effort, uh, I, and I think uh, I, let me take a little bit of time to, because I think this is the they are very tempting. Mm. So one is just the something somebody pointed out. Uh, you know, there are I think there's a paper which is in the title um, "Result from a Million Regressions." And uh, why why a million regressions? Well, you 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 can in a sense there are only you know if you count the number of countries for which we have really you know reasonable quality data for a, a, a you know remember we want to measure growth and we want to say that policies typically at the beginning of the period. Not policies that were results of growth, but policies that were sort of precursors of growth. Those policies were, uh, we have measured good measures of those. So, something like we were to say growth between 1960 and 1985 regressed on policy outcomes in 1960. That's the nature of this exercise. We want to see if the policy outcomes in, in policies in 1960 predict growth after 1960. So, you know, data gets worse as we go back in time, etc. So, you know, you end up with fairly small number of countries actually, not, even though there are maybe 240 
odd countries in the world who for whom you could get some data eventually you end up with maybe only 80 90 countries even less if you look at the quality of the data people have often sort of been skeptical about the quality of data in some countries so if you start pruning you get 70 countries or something so it's not a lot of countries now suppose there were uh, you know what's the problem of having a few countries well each country is one data point it's one growth rate uh, and the number of uh, variables you you have to explain those 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 growth rates is actually enormous why uh, the think of education education is not just one number it's you could and people have shown that it makes a huge difference whether or not you use primary education completion rates, secondary education completion rates, tertiary education completion rates. But that's, that's just one set. Then you can, um, Barrow himself showed that it matters whether you include primary completion among girls, among boys. So do you want to think of, uh, does it matter that mothers have are, are have an education so is it the previous generation's education should be included or not how about engineering uh, some uh, there's a claim that stem education is much more valuable than other education should we divide the number of graduates in stem and in the humanities uh, should we how about uh, how about uh, mother mother tongue instruction are these I mean, quality of the education clearly matters. So what, how do we measure quality? Should we take PISA scores? But not many countries, uh, PISA is an international test which, you know, uh, sort of tries to be comparable, but, you know, not many countries participate in it. So it's hard to, hard to uh, then you end up with 30 countries or something. So, you know, how do I get, um, you know, or in, if you want to use data in 1960, you don't have PISA. So, you know, this is just like uh, it ends up with how do I make the quality comparable? Are they teaching in the mother tongue? Are they, you know, are they teaching in English? Are they teaching, um, are the teachers well paid? Are the teachers not well paid? Uh, are the teachers themselves, do they have, t uh, you know, master's degrees, do they have high school degrees, who are the teachers, all of these are potential measures of education. I just listed 15 and if you think about this you could list another 15, no problem. So you know just education you could think of 15 uh, different, uh, 30 different measures and then we could start healthcare and we could do another 30 measures and so on. And so you, and policy, uh, you know, tariffs, yeah, do we have high tariffs or low tariffs? But that seems very coarse because it you could have high tariffs on goods that very few people consume, high tariffs on ex luxury cars. Is that not the same thing as high tariffs on machines? So how finely should we divide the set of tariffs? So once you start thinking about it, you realize that you could have more than uh, seven, if there are 70 countries, you could have more than 70 variables that are explaining the growth in these countries very easily. You could have, and then basically how do you get a million regressions? You take subsets of these and you can imagine, you know, a set of uh, combinations of let's say 200 variables is very, very large. You take subsets of these and you start running regressions, you can get lots of regressions. So the, the idea that you know, so you start hitting this constraint that you really don't have enough data. You have a bunch of countries, but you have many more variables. And in a sense, you should worry not just about each variable, but their combinations. Because it might be that good education is useful only if there is, you know, uh, the tariffs on machines that educated people use are low. And so you want to think about all the packages. So once you thought about that, you realize that you just don't have enough data to run the regression. You can, you, you first decide what you want to run, then you find something, but that could mean those things are not necessarily, uh, if you run a different regression, you might find something different. And there's a paper by Levin and Renault which does that and basically finds nothing is robust. You add a different variable, you get a different outcome. And I think that's, and that's not surprising, that's not necessarily saying that there isn't any truth in these things, it's just we don't have enough data. 
And once you don't have enough data, things become very unstable when you have lots of variables and very little data. Uh, so that's, that's point number one. Point number two is that uh, in addition, group, it's not clear what, what we should take as the growth rate because growth rates, it turns out, growth is very unstable. Brazil was one of the fastest growing countries in the world in 1980 and then stops growing. India, uh, I told you the reverse story. India was famously slow till 1986 and starts growing. China is famously slow till 1980 and then starts growing, etc. There's just so many examples of, of growth shifting. Bangladesh was famously described as the basket case of the world uh, by Henry Kissinger, who was US uh, Secretary of State. Uh, and now is one of the fastest growing countries in the world. So it's the things, this shift makes it even not clear when, what point of time do I start measuring growth? So that challenge, and the final one is the causality question, which is that, uh, and that's not really unrelated to the many variables question, because you know, if you, if you partly one, one um, you can think of education we, we discussed uh, education, some of those edu variables are perhaps original causes, maybe they had, uh, you know, think of primary school completion. Is that an outcome or is that a, a, a driver? Well, it's probably a driver, but is it also uh, an outcome? It's an, uh, why, why would it be an outcome? Well, because maybe the teachers are good and that's why people are completing primary school, otherwise they would drop out at out of frustration. If the teachers are good, should we therefore uh, assign all the value to, should we then take out the primary school variable and look at just teacher quality? But maybe t teacher quality is itself a reflection of the previous generation's education. And so, you know, we, you end up with this chicken and egg problem, which is, uh, which, so assigning, a, you know, causality to any individual variable is, is a uh, almost uh, insoluble problem. So that's, that sort of makes this agenda, I think, largely, at this point, I don't think there is a huge amount of faith that people get from these results. I'll come back to that point. Is there any question? Yeah. So um, there is a question on like employment. Uh, so the person is asking, uh, whether it's possible to achieve like high levels of employment during the growth process rather rapidly without having to wait for the employment effects to kick in and trickle down like over the long run or something. So in fact, uh, the, if you look at unemployment rates, um, they actually vary a lot between developing countries and it depends a bit. The, the, the problem with it is I think mostly definition of unemployment. So if you take a very poor country, somebody who's not working, is that person really not working? Or is it just that he's not, doesn't have a job? And I think, and a lot of these people are actually doing something. They're, they're sorting to garbage to find something to eat or they're, uh, you know, sell something to sell. They're, you know, if you, if some politician comes and says, uh, you know, can you uh, distribute these handbills today with my name on it? They'll do that. They're doing something. It's not that you can survive on nothing. So a lot of these people, uh, I think the perception of, of uh, their own perception is less. So if you ask them, are you unemployed? They'll say yes, because they don't have the job they want. But they don't, that, that's, that's very different from them not actually being not actually working. And so if you ask them, did you do something that pay, got you paid uh, in the last week? The answer is often yes, maybe paid a small amount, uh, but w which is very different from asking, are you un unemployed? And they'll say also say yes. And so I, I think that in general, um, my guess is that at least among people who are over 30, most people in developing countries are actually, actually males are working. Uh, they are in some form or the other because there's no other way to support them. There's no, the welfare system doesn't exist. So there's just not cho no choice. So I, I, that's to say that I don't think that, I think the question is not 
of, of uh, whether people are employed, but whether they're employed in jobs that give them some satisfaction. And I think that's, that's, that's a big challenge. It's a big challenge increasingly in rich countries as well. And it's, it's not clear how, how one deals with it. We'll, we'll certainly come back to that point as we go. But I, 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 don't, I think it's worth thinking about, uh, you know, there is a, you know, claims of 60% unemployment, but 60% unemployment includes a lot of people who are working. I think that's that, that's the truth of it. Is that it's a bit about also about recognizing whether you are you know a lot of people in, in, in the, take the U.S. U.S. is is famously now has very low unemployment, but it's also labor force participation in the U.S. has been falling. So a lot of people are just dropping out of the labor force and saying, I never find anything I want to do. I just I'm not going to work. But I, so. It, Unemployment is uh, is a product of many of those things. Your your perception of whether you you know, you're working, whether you decided to be in the labor force or not, you could decide not to be in the labor force. And I know, uh, but again, in developing countries, I think you don't really have that much social support. So it's not clear what you do if you if you don't work. So I I think I think the unemployment question is not probably to me that's not the the most useful measure of of a social outcome. It's more is the job of any quality. That's it. Okay. Um, so my colleagues uh, Darona Semoglu, uh, Simon Johnson, and uh, and. Uh, uh, and Jim Robinson, who was then at Harvard and now is at University of Chicago, uh, started uh, a project which was to, with the idea that maybe what we should do is look for the ultimate dis determinants of growth. Maybe uh, rather than really look for something causal, let's focus on, on you know, them finding something that's causal. And they tell an interesting story. The story is, says that, you know, uh, one interesting piece of history is that when Europeans traveled to uh, to colonize countries in, uh, in the develop currently then then in the developing world or whatever the equivalent of it l countries that were weak and could be occupied largely uh, they they uh, they had very different experience. In some places, they, the initial settlers did well. Others, they died like, uh, you know, the, the death rates varied by, a, I think, a factor of 50 or something So between these countries. So an enormous variation in their death rates. And the places where they died in droves, they basically decided that they will not try to settle or not, they instead to be, take economic advantage of their political control over these places, they decided that what they were going to do is they were going to become, they're going to create sort of institutions that allowed them to force other people to generate income that they would then take away. That's a, uh, so in other words, they created exploitative societies. Uh, in where they settled, they were, that was not needed and they, they set up much more egalitarian institutions. Um, and those are countries like US, Canada, New Zealand, um, etc. And if you look at the correlation between settler mortality and this, this, this very settler mortality variable is been uh, much fought over but mostly I think this fact is, I think, very robust, which is that if you look at the places where the settlers died a lot, so that's the, pla that's the places on, on the right of that graph. Uh, there, there the, the, a measure of property, property security, businesses, how, how, how likely businesses were to be taken over by the government, 
or by yeah, some local or, or uh, national government? And the answer is that the businesses are much more secure in places that where, uh, where um, the mortality was low. So countries like Australia and New Zealand have high business security. So this, this, this is the point they are making, which is that business security is maybe valuable for businesses. That's maybe why people don't invest in these other countries is because they know that the government could take away their business. And so you get this very strong you know, negative relationship between settler mortality and uh, property security. And then they go on to show that the same pattern you see with GDP per capita today. The GDP per capita today is higher in places where settler mortality was low. And they interpret it as, uh, and this as saying that the institutions resulting from high set settler mortality were bad institutions and that's what is, is driving this. In, and to to emphasize that, what they do is they look at, if you include settler, settler mortality, do the usual things that everybody you know, used to recommend. This, there was this thing called the Washington Consensus, which is that these are the good things to do uh, for, for growth, sort of fallen by the wayside, thankfully, but low inflation, invest, uh, you know, uh, encouragement of investment, low taxes, education, this was so-called Washington Consensus. Does the Washington consensus set of policies uh, uh, matter once we control for control for the when once we compare countries which had um, you know different levels of uh, in of uh, settler mortality do these additional variables matter and in some ways what the point they are making is really that all of these variables. Uh, may might be driven by the good institutions and the good institutions are what come out, come out of settler mortality and therefore all these policies are not independent uh, choices you can they're really outcomes of something deeper and therefore you know telling countries to go um, go uh, you know improve their um, investment climate or uh, is like telling uh, uh, you know telling me to run a marathon it's, it's, it's not going to happen this it, it sounds sounds good but it, it, it won't it, it won't happen um, so I think this is a remarkable set of findings there's several reasons to worry about what the message is. And the first, I mean, <laughs> here's a cute fact, which is that uh, Sotla mortality also predicts success in soccer. More uh, Sotla mortality, you do better in soccer. Uh, so, you know, better soccer teams are in places with higher Sotla mortality. So that's, so in other words, you know, if you did that, are you saying that soccer is bad for growth? Is that the, uh, so what, the intervening variable, is that really uh, institutions or is it something else? How do we know that? That's, there's no way to actually pin that down because after all, many things persist. Culture persists, uh, uh, legal traditions persist. I think the other, but I think the more more worrying part of it is that it's not clear that we can now just say that well those let's get those institutions and that's enough because the institutions don't really exist in a void the institutions are built by years of history think of the US Constitution which is a, a good institution uh, despite some of the it's a rather egregious qualities but nonetheless but that good institution is a result of jurisprudence over 200 years. People, is, you know, judgments were made, challenged, you know, uh, then the Supreme Court eventually decided one thing. And if you think of right now what's happening in the US, uh, abortion rights, where were seen as secured rights for many years, are being challenged and 
potentially will be overturned uh, because there is uh, because uh, you know the the jurisprudence evolves over time. So it's a, you know there's the, how can one think of a particular institution without its history? The history just think of central banks. Central banks are not just a, a matter of you know having a, a, a central banking act is also that the central bank has a culture, it has a set of people who understand monetary policy, it's a set of people who were trained uh, over years in observing the economic trends inside the country and reacting to them. They, all of the human capital that goes with these institutions won't come in immediately. So are, good, are we observing the effects of good institutions? Are we observing the effects of good institutions plus for 200 to 400 years of history? that goes with them and I think that that makes if we think it's the latter then there's not much we can do in in Togo uh, they don't really have the choice of setting up uh, US institutions today and getting the same results they might actually have disastrous results because these institutions don't come with the history and then maybe they are uh, just the wrong institutions. Uh, So, I am going to, uh, to quickly summarize where we stand and then, uh, then change subjects a little bit. So, this was a quote from Bill Easterly who is who's one of the I think most sharpest critics of, of this you know growth, growth uh, let us find the, the uh, you know m recipe for growth agenda. Bill's views I do not agree with which is that you know there is nothing you can do about it countries have to discover it on their own. Uh, I think that probably is also not correct I but I, I, I let me come back to that point. I will come back to why I disagree with him. But he says I think but he, his view was after two years of of work by the commission of 21 world leaders and experts, an 11 member working group, 300 academic experts, I was one of those 300, 12 workshops, 13 consultations and a budget of 4 million. The experts answer to the question of how to attain high growth was roughly, we do not know but trust experts to figure it out uh, which is a little bit and um, exactly uh, maybe uh, saying that we do not know the answer, we are not going to get there. Um, now, we do know things that is a little unfair because in a sense the, what these, these experts were doing were they are trying to go beyond the obvious and that is where the challenges are. So, you know that uh, probably Soviet, Maoist, North Korean style communism did not do anything great for growth. I think that is probably well accepted. Indian style uh, central planning which is sort of what gets loosened in the mid 80s it did not do anything good for growth. Civil wars and environmental disasters do not do anything good for growth. So, you should avoid civil wars, but those are easy things to say that is not what countries countries accept that. The problem is what do you do next and that is what that that is and do we can we say something useful where it goes beyond that. So, let me pause here and then take up the next set of issues. Yeah. Uh, so, there are two questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, the first one is that um, given the difficulties that you describe of the findings of the policies which can generate growth, etc., uh, what do you think about the Pritchett test as a way to assess whether a policy is an important like determinant of development or growth? And the second one is on the. I don't know what the Pritchett te test yeah. is, so you, maybe you can ask, and we can take up the question. Yeah. So we we just checked, and the Pritchett test is. <clears throat> a test that was proposed as a four-part smell test for pro-development policies, and the test is it's more it's not a pure ad hoc uh, impact assessment, but it specifically addresses whether pro-development policy should be implemented or changed at all. So you are asking four questions, and the first one is: in a cross-sectional comparison of levels, do countries that are more developed have more of these determinants of these characteristics, uh, and so on? So it's basically. Yeah, we, we can. I think we can skip this. Yes. I, 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 I'm going to probably not be super persuaded. Um, okay. The second question is on settler mortality. So the 
person is asking is the mortality of the European settlers inversely proportional to mortality of the, indi of the indigenous people? And does this mean that the Washington Consensus or all those contemporary developmental outcomes, like the variation, can only apply to settler colonies built on top of the extermination of the indigenous people? Yeah, so it's an excellent question. I think, so one of the, one of the, uh, so I think one of the reasons for low settler mortality in some of the, at least in some parts of the world, was that they started by exterminating the existing population. So you didn't have to de deal with, uh, you know, uh, the infections you get from them or, the, you know, the crowded. Uh, so it was in more crowded places that you had uh, more such, such or more mortality. Um, the relatively empty places and the places that were emptied out by either infection or murders by the colonists um, where uh, had lower settler mortality. So I, I think that that's a, that's a real concern is wh whether or not we need to just do ethnic cleansing of some kind before we do it. I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that worry that this is actually telling you a story that's much more gruesome than, uh, yeah. I, I will stop. Any others? Okay. <clears throat> so, as I was saying, we, I mean, the problem with what we know is that it's not that useful for countries. Most countries accept that. The question, in some sense, to give an example, is, you know, think, think about Vietnam and China. For Vietnam, I think the question is how closely to follow China. You know, China, they are certainly very influenced by the Chinese mo mo success. And the question is how far to, uh, you know. And part of that is that we don't actually understand Ch China's success. Uh, there was a, uh, Ch China is, uh, is an example, is it is an example of, you know, the success of, of market economies or as uh, an example of, you know, of uh, how we need to manage the market. The Chinese government's claim is very much that they have their own unique combination of, of uh, markets and public intervention. Certainly, the Ch China is a country where banks are, the banking sector is not only controlled by, by the government, that share of control has gone up. And in general, the share of public ownership in China has gone up slightly in the last few years. So it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's not a country which is, has a, it's a huge part of the capital stock is owned by the government or by the military or other, other institutions that are related to, you know, sometimes provincial governments, but a lot of investment by government. So the question is, is that, now you could say, oh, well, if, if only that didn't happen, China would be even richer. Or you could say the government's view, which is the opposite, which is that it's only because we took those precautions that we are where we are, otherwise we would have had a disaster in our hands. Um, and so there is a, 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 a sort of a, we, the problem is a bit like most examples are like China. You could imagine, you know, some policies they do are, um, you, if you can tell a story which says that, oh, they did this, 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 and this right. Or you could say the opposite, which is that they did this, this, and this wrong. And uh, so if they just fix that, they would do even better. And for Vietnam, they don't want to know, do, should I be uh, as marketized as China, more, less? And I think that question is, is not being answered. The problem is that we, we can say that, you know, uh, Maoist China didn't do well on economic terms, but it's hard to say uh, whether China a, how, to what extent we should imitate China I, in terms of, you know, was it a good thing to have to spend $3 trillion keep, to keep the uh, exchange rate undervalued? Was that too much money wasted? I mean, they, 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 every one of the, these are the questions that we would like answers to. If I were Vietnam, I want to know, do I, should I undervalue my currency 
by the extent China did uh, or not. And that's a question that's very practical. Uh, it, it sh so it's, it's sort of a much more, uh, but it's, it, it's not the kind of question to which we know the answer, unfortunately. So that's, and I, I think the, the, that's a, that sort of brings us to where I think we would like to move this conversation, which is that in fact, I think it's worth useful, um, be usefully making a distinction between very high level statements, which are kind of aspirations rather than policies. Um, so, you know, free market is one of those, but, and again, we can decide how free is good, uh, but to say free market is good is sort of contentless. Most countries have now agreed to that. So therefore, at the margin, it doesn't tell us very much because most countries agree that they should not have like, you know, Soviet style uh, co co communism. Or should we protect pro property rights? Again, protect our property rights sounds like a, a, a good recommendation, most countries have laws which protect pro property rights. Then the question is what do you do at the margin when there is a dispute over, over let's say a loan? Who, who, who's, who, are you on the debtor side or the creditor side? And those things make a potentially a big difference, uh, you know, the, to the lending process, to the, to the profitability of banks, etc. Which side are you on? But those are, those are much more specific questions than protect property rights. Protect property rights is too bland at some level, whereas what you really want to know is how much of, uh, you know, the weight you should put on specific types of, you know, when there's a conflict over property rights, for example, or for environmental reasons, should you uh, be more respectful of the property right or not? Should you, when in a pandemic, should you take away uh, the, the patent of a of a, of a vaccine manufacturer or not. Those are protecting pro property rights. Uh, yeah, at some point you may, may decide to dis, uh, that there's a limit to that. And that's the kind of question we want the answers to. Typically we don't, we don't actually, uh, you know. Uh, so, and therefore it's, if you think about uh, in, invest in education, again that's sort of a, Every country says, yes, we want to invest in education. The question is more how, how to do it well and how to make that, uh, given that you limited resources, what's the best use of those resources? And there, uh, you know, there are different strategies. You could, uh, you could invest in computers, you could change your pedagogy, you could retrain your teachers in particular ways, etc. So those, in some ways, I, we want to shift the conversation from the, uh, the list that's on the left to the left list that's on the right. And that's maybe where uh, that makes the connection between, I think, the attitude in development economics, uh, which is uh, very much about, you know, individual decisions going wrong. I'm investing in education, but I'm not making the right investment. And the, the kind of the flavor of growth theory, which is, are we investing in education uh, enough? And those are just, in some sense, uh, they're not either or, they're complementary questions. Of course, if we increase productivity of education, maybe that warrants investing more. And um, conversely, if we, maybe it's, if, we, if we invest enough, maybe the quality of the investment doesn't matter as much, but we may not have the resources to do so. So these are not entirely separated questions. There is a connection between the growth style question of the quantity, if you like, uh, you know, the macro quantity, total education, is, is this country producing enough uh, university graduates with the uh, development style question, how do I change the, given the resource constraints, how do I change the current system to make the number of uh, university graduates go up, what is the set of micro steps I take to make that happen. But those are not unrelated, but they are, they are talking across some distance. And in some ways what we want to do, maybe a little bit 
now is to is to talk about um, how how these things connect connect to each other in this how do how these ideas from development about you know lots of decisions are not taken optimally uh, for one reason or another the market doesn't function and uh, how does that connect to the the broader concerns about growth the reason for doing that is that if we actually identify individual level failures also individual meaning, meaning micro level failures those can be fixed and we can find ways of fixing them they, we have the way to learn the ways to fix them so we, we have the scope to actually change the outcome in ways that you know if you're telling me that you know you have to invest in human capital uh, at that broad level doesn't address that uh, doesn't give me a helpful way of going forward in, in some ways is that a question there are two questions, on one on China and one on India. Mm. And the first one is, can we predict whether China's growth will slow down like the developed countries that we have been talking about initially? Mm. And then the person is asking whether India's problem um, with growth was the centralized planning process or the contents of the Mahala Nobis growth model, in case Sorry, you yeah. know this one. Mahala Nobis model. Uh, so on the first question, I think China has already slowed down by every measure uh, and will slow down more. Um, I think it's in fact, I think this, the, what we were discussing with respect to rich countries should be a lesson for China that you, you know, growth does slow down and when you, if you try to stop it, uh, by, for example, uh, one of the things China is trying to do is through this belts and roads initiative and other is to kind of expand the uh, on the extensive margin in a sense place find places to invest resources outside China and therefore keep the productivity of, of capital up. Because otherwise the productivity of capital will given that China has a a stable aging population, the productivity of capital will drop uh, for sure. How do you prevent that? You try to bring your capital elsewhere. Now, I think that's in general, I, I think that that has potential, f you know, for doing a lot of good in the world. It has a potential for creating huge numbers of problems. We'll, we'll have to understand exactly how to do that well and, you know, what are the ups and downs, but clearly China, the Chinese leadership knows that this is happening and, and is reacting very, very strongly to it. Whether they're doing it right or wrong, I don't know, but they're reacting to it. And the worry is that uh, like in Japan where they reacted kind of violently to the, to the growth slowdown that happens around 1980, uh, but they never managed to, they just waste a lot of capital, end up with a, high, a hugely did indebted government, but they don't actually manage to fix the problem. So one should accept the fact that this is, this is going to happen and be judicious in how you re respond to it. On the Mahalo, that's a, I don't know the answer to that question. Is there a, could have there been a very different kind of social, uh, socialist planning in India that would have been better? Probably. But I, I, I think that uh, first order, um, the, the, I, I think Ma, the Mahalamish model actually was not, I, was uh, kind of just v didn't spell out much. So I doubt that that's what's to blame for what happened. There seemed to be a completely bureaucratic understanding of that if we control everything, we'll get better outcomes. And one, and so the, the number of ways in which things were controlled was so egregiously high. So you, you not only, you had to get a license to produce, but you had to get a license to, uh, to get land, you had to get a license to hire labor, you had to li get a license to fire labor, it, everything was controlled. And I think the number of controls was uh, that certainly didn't come out of the Malnovish model. It, was ca it came out of a bureaucrat's attempt to say that, look, if the model says do this, I will make sure it happens. I will give no one any freedom. I think it's the complete absence of 
of uh, sort of any flexibility in the system. And I don't doubt that that's because of the Mahalnovich model uh, per se. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, we have time. And there's uh, an, another question actually following exactly up on this with another example of a centralized planned um, economy. And the person is wondering whether we should dismiss the Soviet style economic strategy given the growth of the USSR uh, at the time and versus the growth of Russia today. Uh, I think that's an excellent point, which is that the Russia, I think the transition from USSR to Russia was so so badly managed, but the USSR has already stopped growing way before the transition. That's in fact the, what prompts the transition in the US, USSR is growth really stops in the 70s. And then, then they are increasingly unable to engineer growth. And that's, that's in a sense creates, brings, you know, perestroika and then the change. Now the, what, the way the change was managed was uh, truly awful in many ways. So I, I, I don't want to, uh, it's very hard to say uh, what would have happened if they had not picked the particular, the particular, you know, the mafia dominated uh, change that happened uh, in, uh, and uh, the oligarchic structure that was created. So it's, a, you know, China in a some ways, is a good parallel and it, it managed growth, uh, the transition very differently. So I, I, I don't know, it's how, even Poland and the Czech Republic managed the transition very differently so it's, and uh, had better outcomes. So it's, I, I, I think that it's, to me it's, uh, it's true that the, the post, uh, post communist history of, of Russia has been extraordinarily depressing. And uh, I take the point, but I, I do think that one shouldn't assume that that was the only two choices you had. Okay, so going to what, what was I saying? I was saying that maybe one another way of thinking about uh, the growth, growth process is that uh, it's not just that there are resources and you know, when you don't have resources, you are poor. It's also that your resources are not very well used. And if you take resources that are you being used badly and you use them better, your TFP goes up. So in a sense, another source of growth is improving the allocation of resources, using resources better, using them in ways that are more, uh, you know, using talent better, um, think of um, the fact that uh, India now, um, the women's labor force participation is 23% and falling. And that's, you know, there's tons of talent that's not being used. So is it, should, we, should we take the labor force as being everybody under, s between the ages of 18 and 65? Or should we uh, think of it as being you know, for some reason women are not being used and therefore the talent pool is shrinking in a sense. Uh, and so is it, uh, that's, that's an example of where you could either sort of think, as, think at the macro level, India has lots of laborers or think of it as the more micro level, which is that certain, in certain com uh, communities, women are not working, they're stopping to work. So those are different ways of asking the same question, but they have different, you know, one invites a, a level of both inquiry and intervention, which is at a much more micro level. Um, so this is, a, there, I'm going to give you three examples of, <coughs> of where, you know, you might say resources are not being used perfectly. One is, from India, uh, before cell phones, fishermen would not know where other fishermen have gone. And therefore, they would often land on one beach with the fish where all the others have land landed and then they, would, they couldn't sell the fish and the fish would rot. So, so what cell phones did is it allowed them to use resources better. They could call and say, are there lots of boats there? Okay, I'm not coming. 
and uh, so on. And so that, that's a way, and you can see cell phones led to higher productivity and earnings and investment as well, actually. Um, another example from India, uh, this is, a, this is a, and this is true in many countries, <coughs> we, we, we did some work comparing firms that are own, owned by local agricultural families and firms that are owned by people who have moved there to start a business both producing t-shirts. T-shirts is, this is a great center of t-shirt production. <coughs> and the productivity differences are stark, like, you know, double in some, but same machines are producing twice as much. And when we asked them why, why that's happening, they would say, look, <coughs> the, the farming community, which had low productivity, they, their view is, look, we need something for our children to do. We don't want them to be in agriculture. We want them. And so even if they're not very good at it, as long as they can survive, that's fine. <coughs> Why don't you sell your factory to somebody who's better? Oh, well, but then my son wouldn't have anything to do. He'll be depressed. He'll be sitting at home. So it, it's very much, I think families, families uh, prefer a certain type of misallocation of resources. <coughs> It's so another piece of work we did in, in, in this is in, in Soweto, in South Africa. 54% of, uh, of people in the 18 to 24 range are unemployed. They, they've been looking for a job. The, the expected wage, the expe uh, you ask them how much do you expect to pay? They expect to be paid 1.7 times what people with their skills are being paid. So no, naturally, they don't find the job. When somebody offers them a job, they don't take it. And so uh, they end up with uh, you know, many years, often 10, 15 years of not finding a job based on the idea that maybe, maybe they, uh, they should have. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the kind of job they are looking for is waiting somewhere. And the way that gets sustained is that they, transportation is extremely expensive, so they don't actually go to look for a job. So the job is in, in, in center cities uh, and they, do, they don't go to the job, so they can sit at home and dream of the job instead. And since they never go, they never find out. We did an, a randomized control trial when we gave them vouchers to go travel. And then that bring, makes them much more realistic, maybe too realistic, but they start giving up this idea that you know, there, is a, there are these wonderful jobs out, out there and therefore we should just wait till they drop on my lap and maybe somehow they'll drop on my lap. So there are people, the, the unemployment rates are mind boggling, um, but interestingly, uh, the quit rates for jobs are also high. They, even those who get jobs, they quit because they think that this, the jobs they can get are not the kinds of jobs they should be holding. Because they get jobs as gardeners, the garden, that's not what they think. The office jobs are waiting for them somewhere, but then they don't get those jobs. And so they basically, uh, despite the fact that unemployment rates are very high, they quit their jobs and, they, and so you have a huge part of the labor force which is just sitting around not doing anything. So these are all examples of resources that are being used less than efficiently. And you could imagine interventions like the one I described, which would change the use of those resources and maybe increase efficiency. So to, to summarize, we know very little about how to make sustained growth happen. And in general, I think this, exam, this exercise of trying to read the tea leaves and say, okay, this, is, this country is doing it right, that country is doing it wrong, these exercises largely are fruit, fruitless. Um, and it's a good example. On, on June 23, 1989, the Wall Street Journal announced that the growth winners of the next 25 years will be Bangladesh which was very perceptive because Bangladesh was just beginning to become a potential success. Thailand, which is sort of a mediocre performer, and Zimbabwe, which is a disaster. 
the country they explic explicitly pointed out as, a, as one that's going to fail is China. So, uh, you know, I think predictions is, uh, of, you know, reading the tea leaves of what country is doing what is, is at the macro level, I feel these are all kind of a uh, bit fruitless exercises. We can help countries fix specific problems. Now, that none the, that, that uh, is, uh, is uh, going back to this question about what's going to happen to growth in China. Well, I think in general countries are obsessed by the sort of the idea that they have to do something to uh, make growth go up. And uh, their obs the, so the growth league tables, they're constantly looking at, over each other's shoulders to see who's growing faster. In 1970, the US, the obsession in the 70s was Japan. And there was lots of attempts to basically slow down Japan by not importing their cars. There was all kinds of voluntary export restrictions on Japanese cars and all those things. In 1979, a Harvard professor called Ezra Fogel published a very nice book, which I read, called Japan as number one, arguing that Japan is going to become the world's biggest economy. In 1979, growth slows down in Japan, exactly almost as uh, uh, on cue, and never recovers. And now China has the same obsession. Um, and this, this, this generates bad policies all around, this obsession with winning the growth. Growth has its own cycle. You don't actually win or lose, you're just in a particular place in the growth process mostly. So in that sense, I think that the winning and this idea that, you know, uh, for many of these countries, it's the idea of winning or losing growth is, is a dangerous obsession, which then just leads you to adopt bad policies. And, uh, you know, it, it all it did was create lots of inequality. That same thing is now uh, is true in developing countries as well. Uh, you know, growth rates are reported to the second digit after zero. Given that mostly measurement errors are probably two, three percent, uh, two, three percentage points, the second digit after zero has no meaning whatsoever. But you'll find that you know India could again regain status as a world. But this was today. In fact, I saw there is twelve reports of uh, on India's growth in 2021 um, and they are 12.5% 9.65% the third di second digit after zero features in them and given the extent the fact that you know a bunch of maybe half of gdp is not measured it's just sort of numbers that are inferred from uh, statistics that are collected occasionally. So the informal sector, nobody collects data on a yearly basis. What you do is you actually collect data on the informal sector um, uh, once in five years, calibrate it to the size of the formal sector, and then use that fixed ratio. So the informal sector shrinks, especially in a pandemic. So we have no idea what's actual GDP right now. We can't know it. It's not, there's no way to know it. But we still have like 0.65% and things like that. These numbers will show up. So people are just obsessed and they want uh, to gain a little, win a little. And I think this obsession is, is just distraction. I, 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 think it's, um, is it, I think it's better to invest in things that are, you know, cell phones that allow fish to land are good. Making uh, education better is good. Making people healthy is good. Let's do things that have value. In, in building roads where there are none is good. Let's do things that are where there are value, where we know exactly why we are doing it, not pursuing some, you know, kind of chimerical agenda that uh, doesn't necessarily have any any landing point. And then maybe, uh, and then growth seems to be pretty unpredictable. Sometimes you do all the right things and nothing happens. Sometimes you do, don't do all the right things, but still things work out. So I, 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 I think that we, we, can, we are better off focusing on proximate outcomes that have meaning. So I'll stop there.